the Kiwi Farms legal fund thing, which I announced last Friday, um, has hit its goal. And when I say it has hit its goal, I mean it has actually surpassed, far surpassed its goal. Uh, is that a, I, my original goal, you can't see the original goal on the page, but it was originally $75,000. And I did a little bit of a, I took out my a a abacus and I tallied up the 1,600 people who voted that they would support such a fund. And I divided that by uh, $75,000, which is what it takes to take a small trial or a small claim to like a jury trial. And I approximated that if those people had donated $50 a piece, um, we would be able to hit that goal. Well, the average donation which we received is uh, about, it was at, when it first started, it was at like $500, and then it went down to about $250, no, which is obviously a lot more than $50. Yeah, a, a pop. So a lot of people, and this is, by the way, does not include any of the crypto donations. I think that in total we've received, received about $5,000 plus, $5,000, $7,000 in crypto. And I have absolutely no idea what to expect in terms of the uh, mail because I went out of my way to make sure that you could donate with a uh, money order. And I also went out of my way to try and explain in simple English that anyone can understand how to get a money order. Uh, it also, I think foreign, foreign cash will also be accepted, but, um, yeah, so I, I have no, I really don't know. We'll only get this every Saturday, I think. So I'll have uh, my first update on how much was received this Saturday in terms of money orders and checks. Uh, but obviously, this is a lot more than I expected, which gives me a lot of leeway in how I pursue things. And among those things, I'll, I'll uh, re reiterate what the original fund is for. Uh, there was a little bit of money that was going to be set aside regardless for Greer. Because Greer has been suing me for, I think, five years at this point. And even Greer is like, a, Greer is exhausted by this because he's been in court for five years. And we're literally at the beginning again. Um, he got pro bono representation to go to appellate court and get one of the most bizarre um, appellate court judgments I've ever seen. Um, which left a lot of people who do IP law for a living scratching their head wondering what the fuck they're reading. Um, and now his reward for winning that appellate court uh, verdict is that he's now representing himself again he does not have representation and it's back to square one so uh after four years I, I think it was 2019 that he filed so in 2019 he filed and now it's 2024 and he's back at square one and he's by himself again so he's gonna have to file everything by himself and uh he's not <laughs> i think that uh, he's a little bit over it so uh, we'll see how that pans out. Um, the appellate court decision that we received, again, I'll reiterate, is perplexing. It's baffling. Uh, so we're going to appeal it to the Supreme Court. And even though I think one in a hundred cases get accepted by the Supreme Court, the, the the verdict that we received from the appellate court is so bad that it it intrudes on Supreme Court case law. Like it directly contradicts what the Supreme Court justices have established like 15 years ago. So it's it's a terrible terrible decision that really upsets the balance of 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 things and uh it the worst thing that it does is that there's a lot of um uh charitable works that monitor copyright claims um for instance the lumen database which a lot of people who work in law or copyright may be familiar with um and the the judgment effectively said that because i published greer's dmca takedown notice that was part of how it, he demonstrated like um the contributory copyright infringement. So me publishing our correspondence was contributory copyright infringement, according to the judge, which means that anyone uh, doing publicizing their DMCA takedown notices is somehow, according to this, now exasperating their legal liabilities. If you contribute to an open source database about DMCA takedown notices, um, that means that you are uh, adding, you're exposing yourself to more to litigation risk, which is obviously a chilling effect on free speech and your ability to discuss your um, your legal problems. Uh, obviously, that's a terrible precedent to set. So uh, yeah, we have the money to appeal it, so we are appealing it. Um, the other one is Epic and Alejandro Caraballo, who had made the false claim, completely false, like literally in the 11 years, the 11 years now, This just so uh, as of the third, yeah, as of the third, uh, so on Saturday, the Kiwi Farms is now 11 years old under my administration. And in the 11 years, we have literally, and remember, I am involved in the day-to-day -day moderation, and I have been involved the entire fucking time. 
Um, and not once have we ever had child pornography posted to the site. Never. Um, I would, I would obviously fucking recognize this. Um, and even if we had just one time, someone like tried to slip it in, you can't say that we host child pornography because we fucking don't, but we never have. So, uh, after getting this fun, interestingly, Epic decided to delete their tweets and Alejandro Caraballo decided to delete their tweets saying that we host child pornography. Isn't that strange? I wonder, um, between Friday and today, what happened, what information Alejandro Caraballo and Epic had received to change their perspectives on the Kiwi farms. They must have received some kind of compelling uh, piece of, of information that informed their perspectives and, and, and uh, increased their understanding of the Kiwi farms. And I, I really don't know what it could have been. I don't know what, what someone sent them, what article they read. Uh, really baffling. In particular, by the way, and I don't want to, I don't want to like gloat and say like, ha ha, I have scared these people into silence. Cause that's not what I want. Um, but, but these, they know that it's false. They know that it's not true. And in particular, even Ethan Ralph had published something about the Kiwi farms hosting child pornography after, oh, cause I lost my human processors. And he gloated and said, what about the child porn? And then he deleted that tweet. So Ralph also deleted that. Um, which I mean, they should because they shouldn't have posted it to begin with because they know it's they know it's bullshit. Uh, and then also, finally, at the very bottom, thank you for the ten dollars by the way. At the very very bottom, there's Liz Fung Jones, and this is a two way street because I have to help Benny because it's basically my fucking fault that a random guy is getting fucked with by this insane sadistic tranny. Um, and then there is suing. Liz Fong Jones and Honeycomb. Make that clear in case. Honeycomb is very aware of what's happening. Um, Liz Fong Jones has been allowed to use uh, his work email to harass people, his work credentials to bolster his claims. Uh, his work has been contacted because he's been doing this, and they are fully 100% aware of it and also supporting of him in what he's doing. Oh, I forgot the, the, the Twitter feed. Let me bring that up real quick. Uh, so they'll be involved. And the, the question is, even $150,000 is a lot of money, and it can definitely afford a lawsuit, maybe even two lawsuits, uh, unless you're suing a big company and, and unless you're keeping the scope down. Um, we talked to a firm that would was a big name firm, like would have absolutely have the capacity uh, to scare the fuck out of anyone if we hired. And they were the biggest firm that was willing to even entertain the idea of representing the Kiwi farms in this. The problem is, is that they want like $1,000 an hour to handle this case, which means that taking it all the way up to trial would be like half a million dollars. Um, that's not tenable. <laughs> so even with even with $150,000, right, there is a, uh, a risk of... of biting off more than you can chew. And this remains a like a David and Goliath situation where we have to be very lean uh, and very responsible. And the representation that that we go for has to be ideologically aligned because we can hire really good lawyers, but unless they're like actually, uh, and what they were asking for, by the way, they wanted $10,000 on retainer and then 40, they expected to charge, they wanted to bill us for, um, a uh, consultation, which they estimated would cost $40,000 in total. And then at the end of that, they would give us a decision if they could represent us or not. <laughs> so they, they want, that's how, that's how expensive corporate law is. They wanted $40,000 for a decision before even moving into the, the, the trial into like the litigation phase of things. And I'm sure if I had a million dollars to spare, uh, that would be a extremely strong choice to go with. I do not have a million dollars to spare. So, um, I, I think that California will be the jurisdiction. However, there is a, a variety of jurisdiction available to me because it's targeting me as a person, as a Floridian, uh, a Wyoming company, a West Virginian company, um, and Liz Wong Jones and Honeycomb are both in California, uh, in the Silicon Valley area. So which I think is the Northern district of California. So, uh, and we're also, I'll explain this in a little bit, but we're considering 
a bunch of different stuff. Anyways, my point is so someone reached out who was a lawyer in California who had um, been a lawyer for a couple of years and worked in uh, free speech litigation. Actually, more than a couple of years. They were a senior attorney. Um, but they didn't want to represent us outright. <laughs> so I'm still... But I'm, I mean, honestly, it would be great if we had somebody who was like in this field wanting wanting to for an ideological reason to set a precedent that deliberate meddling and anti-business anti-competition practices um apply to deplatforming so that shit like this cannot continue and i feel like i mean it's so obvious like liz fung jones has not been quiet about what he's doing um it's not that he does he it's not like he doesn't have money to to try and take from him and it's not like that his company especially which is complicit doesn't have money to take from him so it's like everything that you could possibly want is there you take all of his statements about uh, admitting to meddling admitting to hiring people in a conspiracy a literal conspiracy to um destroy a website by um interfering with its business practices it's just all there the only thing that we need is to set it up and knock it down um it's a really strong case but we uh we need to have we need to keep it very lean basically even again even with one hundred fifty thousand dollars, it has to be real fucking lean really lean and mean case and um i'll leave it at that but there's plans there's lots of thinking this is like the stage where now it's like okay now we have some parameters for what we're doing and we can start thinking long term about how to to correct the course uh cool uh and one other thing worth mentioning at this juncture is that it's a it's a good idea even again a lot of people are like like lining up all these people i could sue like what about this person they expect me to like sue like eight different people at once it's not gonna work like that um you have to you still you still have to be grounded in reality because what how like you look at the um tie beard shit and you look at what happened to Vic Mignogna, uh, you cannot fuck around. It's a it's a serious proposition. Like this is when you go to courts like this and you're dropping one hundred fifty thousand dollars to fuck with some co company, you have to you have to make sure that you're you're handling it with like the respect that it requires. Because if you don't, you're really really gonna fuck yourself up and you're gonna regret doing it. Um, Tybeard was was ordered to pay three hundred and seventy six thousand dollars for a. For what it's called a fee shifting statute, um, when or an anti slap law, but an anti slap is a type of a fee shifting statute. Basically, when Ty Beard uh, went gung ho and filed in state court uh, for defamation in Texas, which is a very pro pro corporation state, which has a lot of safeguards for companies, um, they didn't. For various reasons, uh, it's a combination of a lawyer not doing due diligence, the judge being very hostile. Um, it is true that Ty Beard fucked up, but the judge in this case was like out for blood. They, he did not want to deal with the defamation case. Uh, so the judge was really, really cruel um, to the plaintiff in this. And it was it was so cruel, actually. That I actually had Hardin look into this. I said, I say Hardin because I want to, it just makes more sense. His name is just Hardin, which sounds like it would have an E in it, not an I. But uh, Hardin looked into it and he said that after this case, the state of Texas actually amended their anti slap law to be less hard and require less proof to get passed, specifically, apparently, specifically because of the uh, Vic Mignogna case. Um, but yeah, his life got completely fucked up because of this bullshit. And uh, Ty Beard is now in hiding. I think he moved to... I think I saw him at the bar. When I was out over there at the bar in Belgrade, and I was hanging out with uh, Tupac and Hitler and Epstein, I think I, there was a new guy there, and I swear he looked so much like Ty Beard. I was like, what's he doing out in Belgrade? Why is he out in Serbia? I don't know. It could, it could have been mistaken. There's lots of fat guys with beards, but I swear to God it was Ty Beard. <laughs> and Elvis, yeah, that's right. Elvis doesn't come too much anymore. He's old. <laughs> Thanks so for watching this clip. This is Willow. Remember to like and subscribe.